Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to this book panel. Uh, this is an important moment for all those who worked very hard for the last six years on the project and then the volume, Israel-Palestine, Lands and Peoples. It is also a good moment to thank all those who supported this project. I would like to especially thank the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, and in particular, its wonderful director, Ed Steinfeld, for his in, in engagement in the project and his generous financial support, as well as Dean of the Faculty, Kevin McLaughlin. None of the many workshops and other events of the project, including this meeting, would have been possible without the administrative genius of Christy Kilgus. I would also like to thank my former PhD student, Dr. Amy Kerner, for helping steer this volume with its 21 contributors to a safe, indeed, quite elegant publishing harbor. And I'm holding the book that just arrived a couple of days in my hands. And of course, I'm deeply grateful to the fantastic contributors, the extraordinary and original research, and their patience with my endless querings and nagging. Without them, this volume would have remained nothing but a vague idea. When I began organizing this book launch, I naturally first asked the director of the Center for Middle East Studies, Nadia Al-Ali, as well as other colleagues at Brown concerned with Palestine, Israel, and the Middle East more generally, including Srimati Mitter, Ariela Azulai, Faiz Ahmed, and Elias Muhanna, to join this panel. Unfortunately, none of them was available. Nor was my colleague Shah Dumani, who, as you know, is now serving as president of Birzeit University in Palestine. I also invited Dr. Arid Sabahuri, Dr. Safa Abu Rabia, and Dr. Bashir Bashir, and Professor Amal Jamal of Israel Palestine, all of whom worked with me on the project in the past, but they too could unfortunately not attend. But I was thrilled and delighted that so many wonderful scholars, all associated in many ways with the project, including some of the contributors to this volume, generously accepted my invitation. I have no doubt that we will have a very exciting panel, and I'm looking forward very much to the presentations and to the discussion that will follow. I hope that as you hear them speak, and if you read the volume, you will be persuaded both of its highly inclusive nature and of the extent to which it presents some of the most cutting edge scholarship on Israel-Palestine. The project and the resulting volume sought to better understand the complex, often fraught, but always powerful relationship of Jews and Palestinians to the land of Israel-Palestine, to listen and to learn from each other, not only to proclaim inclusivity, but also actually conduct a sustained, if never easy or comfortable dialogue. Not everyone wants to join this conversation, but I believe that those who do will profit from it and help bring about a change, however modest, whereas those who do not will only perpetuate animosity and violence. Thank you again, and let me now hand over this virtual podium to my dear friend and incredibly former student, Alon Confino. It's all yours, Alon. Thank you so much, Omer. I'm Alon Confino. I teach history at uh, UMass Amherst, where I'm the Pentishkach Chair of Holocaust Studies, and I direct the Institute for Holocaust Genocide and Memory Studies. Um, I participated in a few of the workshops organized by Omer in the last few years. They were always excellent. Um, and I thank Omer for this uh, year long project and for the book. I actually didn't believe that he's gonna pull it through, but it's an excellent book with diverse group of uh, writers. We have excellent panelists today. I'd like to present them very briefly. Uh, they are gonna speak alphabetically then we are gonna open the floor for discussion. Uh, you can write down your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will moderate the, the discussion. 
And a few minutes before 1.30, we are gonna hand over the uh, word again to Omer, who is gonna say some concluding words. We want to move from the presentation immediately to your questions. So um, we, we don't let Omer uh, comment on the presentations. Our first speaker will be Debbie Farber, who is a PhD candidate in the politics and government department at Ben Gurion University. Adi Ophir is professor emeritus at Tel Aviv University and visiting professor at Brown University. Professor Ilan Pape is director of the European Center for Palestine Studies, University of Exeter at the UK. Dr. Nida Shuri is a lecturer and political researcher whose book, Israeli Arab Political Mobilization Between Acquiescence, Participation and Resistance was uh, published a few years ago and Israeli Arab is in quotation mark. Miriam Summit is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Kreitman School of Advanced Studies and at the Institute for the Study of Israel and Zionism at Ben Gurion University. And finally, Alex Winder is a visiting assistant professor and director of undergraduate studies at the Center for Middle East Studies at Brown University. Debbie, the floor is yours. Thank you. So thanks, Elon. And I would uh, like to thank uh, Omer for the invitation to speak on this inspiring panel. And congratulations again for the birth of this important and much needed uh, publication. So um, I will start now. So the Great Return March protests were launched in Gaza for the first time on the 13th of March, 2018. It had begun as a civil initiative of 20 young activists who invited the people of Gaza to join and mark the Palestinian Land Day as a nonviolent protest and raise awareness to the situation of refugees still living in camps. Despite the, di the difficult living conditions of Palestinians at present under the Israeli siege, the organizer chose to emphasize the future, calling for mobilization of the rights, which includes the right of return. In Israel, the return marches were presented immediately as events organized by the Hamas movement. Although the demonstrators were unarmed and did not endanger the armored soldiers, it was framed as an existential threat and the participants as dangerous terrorists. This image that you see was taken by, the, by an Israeli photographer commissioned by the mainstream news website documented the march and encapsulates the common myth of the few Jews facing the threatening Arab mob or majority. In the image, we can observe a huge swarm of faceless people, which occupies most of the frame as if threatening to flood its hall. At the bottom, few Israeli snipers stand on mounds of sand. And although we cannot see that they are armed and protected, the tear gas spotlights over the crowd reminds the Israeli public eye that the army is guarding the borders and using measures to prevent the crowd from crossing the fence separating between Israel and Gaza. I would like to suggest that this photograph distills the way in which the return is being perceived by the Israeli public as dystopia. This is the visual fulfillment of the Israeli nightmare in which masses of Palestinian refugees are infiltrating through the country borders, seeking to return to their homes. In the dark reality in which we live in, where any political imagination of shared life and equality between the two peoples seem impossible, return had become an abstract idea, moving between two parallel axes that never seem to meet, the Israeli nightmare and the Palestinian dream. My research, which an early version of it was published in the book we are launching today in collaboration with Omar al Bari, my colleague from Zohot NGO, sought to find out how, despite the sweeping denial of Palestinian presence and agency, refugees and displaced persons continue to resist in creative ways, opposing the Israeli state authority to prevent their return. The visions I will present in the short time available to me is what I identify as visual utopias, which were created in the last two decades in Israel, Palestine and the diaspora by architects, artists, and activists who imagined, invented, and planned, and planned special visions of potential return. 
Given the wide range of initiatives, as well as the wealth of meanings and interpretations I follow through my research, I argue that even if this radical utopian activism is unable to make the alternative of return possible in present times, it allows to challenge the assumption that there is no such alternative. I use the concept utopia in the sense applied by the Marxist philosopher Ernest Bloch, who threw the terms concrete utopia and did not yet demonstrated how utopia is the horizon, an objective and real possibility, allowing us to see that has not yet been realized, but exists already as a potential in the present. I chose to show today the work of uh, DAR, Decolonizing Art Research Residency, an architectural collective founded in 2007 by architects and theorists, Sandy Hilal, Alessandro Petty, and Eyal Weizmann in Betzahu, Palestine. The collective's work combines conceptual speculations and pragmatic special interventions, discourse and collective learning. In the last two decades, Dar were among the pioneers thinking, conceptualizing, and developing ideas, experiments, and plans for Palestinian return, a term they offer to use to explore plural form, returns, emphasizing its multiple layers, potentials, and meanings. As they argue, and I quote, traditionally, the return is understood as a coming back to one's place of origin and one's property. However, during the years of exile, conditions have changed not only in the cities, towns, and villages that were cleansed, but also in the places of refuge, where a new political culture had gradually started to articulate itself, end quote. In their work, Dar mainly focused on refugees living in refugee camps in the West Bank reminding us that the ongoing desire for return is the strongest possible challenge to the sovereign power of the state. The publication, Book of Returns, was launched in 2010. It includes various proposals for the return of Palestinian refugees who currently live in camps in Bethlehem and Lebanon to the destroyed villages of Miske and Kfar Anan, located in the north of Israel. Through maps, aerial photographs, interviews with refugees, personal impressions, and architectural sketches, those architects created diverse special visions of return. The image that I show here is a model of return for refugees from the Heishe camp in Bethlehem to the historical lands of Miske. It is imagined and planned in relation to the present lives of the refugees in the camp, and specifically to the culture that they had developed during the years of exile. The only architectural uh, object that you see in the picture upstairs is, uh, is the al Fenik Cultural Center, which was originally established in the Haishe and provided education, culture, and leisure to refugees and their descendants. This, according to this vision, will be replicated and re-established in the territory of the destroyed village of Miske and will serve as its core around which the political, communal, and cultural life of the returning refugees will grow and develop based on the culture they developed during the, their exile. As such, al Finik acts as a bridge between the site of origin and the site of exile and refuge. In another project titled Back to the Future, 13 young residents of refugee camps in the West Bank were asked by the collective to imagine their return to their homeland in the year of 2040, when this the right of return was already granted by Israeli. Um, the outcome of the project was the booklet Vision, which included texts, poems, and visual images, as well as interventions, which allowed the young people to come into new insights about their life in the present. According to most of the proposals, the camp will not be dismantled or destroyed, but will be developed for the refugees wish to stay or will come to visit. For those young people, not only the homeland in historical Palestine was the desired home, but also the camp. Those two visions can be read as radical utopian visions, allowing the experimentation and invention of new political possibilities and ideas, which allows dynam dynamism, as well as dismantling and mixing, mixing of spaces and times. The futuristic aesthetics of the first vision, for example, and I return here, such as the dramatic light and the intensive narrative, to state only a few, 
relates to the presence of the spiritual, alluding to an alternative vision of a far away fantastic reality described here as a full and in better world. Those visions in this way allow alternatives to stay as a horizon and allow us to imagine different potential life forms as possibilities. And I will leave you with that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I cannot do justice to the volume's richness and its many original co contributions. And therefore, I will lim limit myself to a few comments about what seems to me the most important act which the book performs. In his afterword to the collection, Alon Confino notes that an essence of the Zionist project has been a denial of indige indigenous national rights. And this denial has been either ignored or seen as natural by Zionist historians. I would like to add to this that the historians may stand for mainstream Jewish political thinking about Israel, and that the denial of Palestinian national rights is not merely ignored. It is often perceived as a condition for the viability of the Jewish state. This basic understanding of Zionism is shared by most, if not all, of the book's participants. And this is one of the book's merits. It does not reproduce Zionist systemic denial of denying Palestinian rights. It does not seek to prove the historical injustice, but assumes it. A fresh air of thinking, free of Zionist ideology, comes from its pages. Instead of reproducing the denial, the volume presents sophisticated, manifold scholarly manifestations of the many faces and forms the denial has taken, including the denial of this denial itself. The phrase denying Palestinian rights, however, is too vague to capture the historical injustice. In the opening chapter of the volume, Hanan Hever cites Zev Dubnov, an early nationalist immigrant who wrote in 1882, our ultimate goal is to conquer the land of Israel and restore the political independence stolen from the Jews 2000 years ago. Coming back to this quote, Alon adds an understatement. Variations of this disregard of, of the Palestinians, this book shows have continued until the present. For most of the contributors, however, a stake is not mere disregard of Palestinians, but the active wish to displace and replace them. Zionism has been many things for different Jewish communities, some of them of great value, great positive value, some much less so, but for the Palestinians, it has been first and foremost displacement and replace, replacement by Jews who came from elsewhere. Some of the chapters in the collection demonstrate this basic feature of Zionism. Others presuppose it, and none contests its importance. We usually associate such a movement of displacement and replacement with settler colonialism. Sam Fleischacker, one of their contributors, is the only one who disputes the applicability of the term. He thinks that a clash of nationalism paradigm fits better. And one of the reasons that, that it fits better is that it can account for Zionism colonial aspect. So in fact, the recognition that for Palestinians, Zionism was a great storm of displacement and replacement runs unabashedly throughout the book against a long history of Zionist denial. Two episodes of this storm are reconstructed here with great care in Noah Rubin's study uh, of this city planning in mandatory Netanya and in Alon's revival, uh, uh, retrieval of the history of Talbia. Alon notes a second unshakable Zionist principle that has characterized the Zionist project from its inception, separation. The book provides a variety of examples to this uh, principle and no attempt to dispute its central role. Here too, we may push Alon's gentle phrasing one step farther. The Jewish state, a project, as a project, as an institution, requires, feeds itself off, and ceaselessly manufactures a plethora of well-integrated partition lines, making separation a multidimensional project. Partition lines run virtually everywhere, 
from constitutional laws to the most ephemeral practices. In the occupied territories, they become most visible, bearing the most horrendous con consequences. But partition was neither born there uh, nor stopped uh, at, 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 at its border. As Inon Cohen and Nev Gordon make clear in their detailed analysis of Israel's biospatial politics. Should we call this integrative network of partitions apartheid? Some of our authors do this without apology. Others describe partitions without naming this, the, the system that generates and enforces them. Unlike settler colonialism, the term apartheid is not debated here. In fact, the book provides ample reasons to justify its use and no finding or argument to dispute that. This is not surprising. No one can talk seriously about Israel-Palestine without invoking its system of partitions. If this is not South African apartheid, it must be its Jewish cousin. The scholarly consensus I'm describing here is in fact common sense. The basic partition lines are taken for granted by most Israeli Jews. Their legal expression is perceived as necessary or at least acceptable. And the prospect of their radical obliteration, that is the systematic renunciation of Jewish privileges is a source of great anxiety. Likewise, displacement and replacement are often acknowledged as a necessary evil done at the time the state was established. As for the present, the question is not whether the practice is ongoing, of course it is, uh, in the West Bank, Jerusalem, and the Negev, but whether it is necessary and perhaps reverse, reversible. How comes then that stating the obvious is a great merit of a scholarly book, even a reason to call it courageous? There are two reasons for this. One relates to the book itself and the other to its political discursive setting. The book does more, much more than stating the obvious. It actually performs it, even when it does not spell it out. And at the same time, and often originally, many of the essays examine different modalities of the obvious, denaturalize and problematize it. Here are three examples. Hanan Hever historicized Zionism by discussing a pre-Zionist Jewish migration to Palestine of Hasidic groups coming from the Eastern Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries for whom the intimate attachment to the land was not territorial and lacked any aspiration for sovereign rule. When Zionist political theology is juxtaposed to the Hasidic political theology that preceded it, the sheer contingency of Zionism, its, na its nationalist religiosity, and especially its violent logic are laid bare. Lital Levy uses this course analysis to, to deconstruct a familiar mechanism, Holocaust comparisons, through which the obvious is excused and the guilty subject absolve themselves of its burden. Ian Lustig examines worried, is, examines worried Israelis who openly speak about the possible demise of their state. These are people who have realized that the obvious is no longer hidden under the cover of liberal Zionist ideology and that it has been laid bare for anyone to see and hence may not be sustainable for much longer. The importance of, of performing this obvious in this way becomes clear once we consider the stage. At a time when the critique of Zionism and of the state of Israel is under attack, when the critics like the authors who took part in this project are regularly accused of being anti-Semite, and the ideology of anti-antisemitism that animates these attacks has become the core of a Judeo-Christian alliance that seeks to redefine the West and, its, and reinvent its separation from each others. At such a time, to state the obvious and insist on its problematization is a necessary starting point. In the opening to the, his introduction uh, to the book, Omar Bartov describes a consensus that serves as the premise to this volume, and I'm quoting, all those involved have a right to a home in the deepest sense of the word, somewhere in the land they claim to be their own, as long as they do not deny the right of, uh, to, to others 
or attempts to violently oppress or remove them. The inclusion in this volume of Salman Abu Sita's detailed plan for the return of refugees and the visions of return discussed by Debbie Farber and Omar El Gubari indicate that Omar fully understands the practical implication of this abstract premise. But the four year project he initiated and skillfully directed and the book he edited are not about this premise, but about the reason for stating it. And this is the reason. In Israel, Palestine, it is obviously not the case. In fact, it has never been the case that all those involved have had the right to a home in the land they claim to be their own. Obviously, in the most banal sense of the word, too many have been deprived of a home. This has not been an accidental feature, but a basic condition of Zionism. And this condition needs to be stated, problematized, and morally scandalized. It is for doing this, at this historical moment, that the book and its editor deserve the highest praises. Thank you. Um, start my video. Well, it's totally in the dark. Well, praises said in the dark are even stronger than those say, said in the day of light. I do not uh, elude myself uh, that language can transform uh, reality. Language, however, can help sustain realities. Thus offering a counter language can counter a reality one wishes uh, to change. Therefore, I would argue that a certain vocabulary sustained the colonization of Palestine until 1948 by the Zionist movement and also sustained the absence of any equ equitable uh, solution since 1948. The hegemonic vocabulary presented the situation in historical Palestine as a conflict between two national movements, one modern Western peace-seeking movement, Zionism and Israel, and an Arab national movement resorting eventually to terrorism with a weak moderate wing that is insignificant and which has become in recent years more Islamized than before. Since the, the mid-1960s, Palestinian scholars and non-Palestinian scholars suggested employing the paradigm of settler colonialism for the case study of Palestine. It somehow failed to hold water for a while, but it made an impressive return as a dominant paradigm inspiring intriguing work on the past and the present realities in Israel and Palestine. This has not influenced the world of, this has also uh, influenced the world of activism within the global civil society and might challenge uh, uh, in the future, uh, the discourse, the attitudes and the politics of the political elites uh, in the West and beyond the West among countries and international actors who have the power to influence the reality on the ground in Israel and Palestine. Like all such paradigms, settler colonialism is based on the comparison between historical case studies in different parts of the world at different times in history. And therefore, of course, there are many similarities as well as there are many dissimilarities between the case studies. But it seems that the overall idea that this is a human phenomenon that began somehow in the 17th century of European refugees fleeing from their homes, seeking a homeland at someone else's homeland and getting rid of the indigenous population uh, is basically common to many of the settler colonial uh, case studies, including the colonization of Palestine by the Zionist movement, which began in 1882. So these kinds of, which Adi referred to as uh, displacement and replacement took many forms, but in essence, this simplified historical process is accurate as an opening gambit, at least for uh, imposing, if you want, the settler colonial paradigm on the Israeli and Palestinian case studies. It created, and this is another common feature, it created in many cases, or led many in many cases to the genocide or ethnic cleansing of the indigenous uh, uh, people. 
And in cases where the genocides or, or the ethnic cleansing operation did not take place or were incomplete, the remaining native population remained under systems of segregation and oppression to which the word apartheid as a generic phenomenon is very much apt. Uh, effect of life, it seems that nowadays, and I think both uh, that Adi referred to this as well, it's effect of life that is now recognized even in the mainstream literature on Israel and Palestine, and even by Israeli human rights organizations such as B'Tselem. It is interesting, and this is just a side note, that official Israel is quite bewildered by this development that you cannot attribute these kinds of uh, to, to th this kind of terminology to uh, lunatic margins of the society, but rather to the mainstream of that society, is really something very bewildering for the Israelis. Nachman Shai, the minister of the diasporas in plural, revealed just a, a day ago that the survey his ministry conducted showed that around 56% of the Jewish academics in the US, that is academics who define themselves as Jews, regard Israel as an apartheid state. He explained that he's on his way, he might have already arrived, uh, and I'm sure he will also meet uh, uh, some of you, uh, on his way to the United States to explain to all these academics that they were wrong and are wrong, and he seemed quite sanguine about his chances of doing so. Until he succeeds, it seems that the new vocabulary is becoming the word of the day and will, as I said, probably influence the discussion, if not the reality on the ground. The main entry of this old new vocabulary replaces the term peace term with decolonization. Decolonization is the main aim of a campaign I belong to, the campaign for the one democratic state, but also of uh, many other uh, groups and NGOs that seek an alternative way forward uh, for reconciliation and justice in Israel and Palestine. The need to focus on decolonization stems directly from recognizing that Zionism was a settler colonial state and that Israel is a settler colonial, I'm sorry, that Zionism was a settler colonial movement and that Israel is a settler colonial state. Settler colonialism is also an ideology that puts simply covets the indigenous homeland and having in it as few natives as possible. The method for Zionism was ethnic cleansing beginning in the 1920s reaching its peak during the 1948 Nakba, but it was incomplete, both in terms of space and geography, uh, space and demography. In this respect, the June 1967 war was inevitable. The geographical project had to be completed and was completed. The demographic one became more complicated, but was dealt with other means. A military rule already imposed on the Palestinian minority inside Israel until 1966, was swiftly imposed on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip from 1967. Incremental ethnic cleansing began in June 1967 of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and continues to this very day. But it also occurs in the Galilee and in the Nakab, the Negev, and it will remain a way of life, the DNA of the regime, and will not, and will not probably be challenged in any significant way from within the Jewish society. In this respect, the understandable wish to solve the problems through seemingly a logical idea, partition, two-state solution, became from the moment it was offered in 1947, or maybe even in 1937, means of, for implementing the settler colonial project, not means of dismantling it or even limiting it. Bodies representing Palestinians today still subscribe to the two-state solution, a uh, to a body which is, actually a body in the morgue whose funeral is overdue, but not the Palestinian civil society. But it cannot be a slogan, even if many Palestinians today support it, and not even a vision alone. It needs to be broken down. It needs to be broken down to detailed explanation of how we get there and what will be its features, how it would look a decolonized historical Palestine. This has to be a Palestinian project, first and foremost, if you accept that settler colonial paradigm and share the exposure of the two-state solution as a charade providing immunity from an, for an ongoing Israeli impunity, you need to let the Palestinian National Liberation Movement 
uh, lead you into a decolonized future. However, however, it will be envisaged. Uh, and whatever its future station or stages will be, it will be a messy project. Nobody should promise the Israeli Jewish society that transforming an apartheid state of a kind into a democracy at the heart of the Arab world will be bereft of mistakes and moments of despair. But it is the only way forward and can be done only, uh, and can be done, sorry, while learning from the mistakes elsewhere. The longer we wait, the brutalization of the Israeli policy will become worse with implication for the struggle for civil and human rights in the Middle East as a whole. But more important, and with this I will end, this is not just a Palestinian problem. As writers such as Nadine El Enani and Paul Gilroy have shown, decolonization is vital for the West as a whole, in its own societies, in its own states, as a restitutive process of justice without which the world will not be able to deal with the other issues facing it, such as pandemics, global warming, and poverty. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Alon. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Omer for the uh, panel invitation, as well as the opportunity to be part of this uh, uh, interesting project and book. Um, I understand I have very little time, so I plan to use my time to talk briefly about uh, one of the key issues that is largely ignored when discussing the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and uh, peace process and solution, and that is uh, 1948 Palestinians. Uh, 1948 Palestinians, or what is commonly known as Israeli Arabs, are the uh, Palestinian minority within Israel itself. Um, they are those Palestinians and their descendants who remained on their land during and after the 1948 war that led to the establishment of Israel on two thirds of historical Palestine, or what used to be British Mandate Palestine. Now, um, at the conclusion of the war, those Palestinians who were and still are an integral part of the Palestinian people, they found themselves uh, within the borders of the new established Jewish state. Um, they were placed under a military rule uh, for nearly two decades. Um, and at the same time, uh, they were given Israeli citizenship, uh, either immediately or in many cases, um, some decades later. Today, 1948 Palestinians account for over 20% of Israel's population. They are often referred to as a democratic, uh, a demographic sorry, threat, uh, when in fact, I believe um, they are a democratic problem that makes it more challenging for Israel to explain how privileging one ethno-religious group over another can be compatible with uh, democratic values. Now, despite holding Israeli citizenship, 1948 Palestinians have suffered and continue to suffer from racism, discrimination, and neglect. Uh, this ranges from um, public expressions of hatred towards them by Israeli officials uh, to shortages or lack of services and funding, uh, discriminatory laws uh, like the one that I will be uh, talking about in a few seconds, and even the targeting and killing of civilians. Now, in, in 2018, the Israeli Knesset approved a new law officially called Basic Law Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people. Now, in the absence of the constitution in Israel, basic laws serve as a guide for the legal system and can only be changed uh, by a new revised or revised uh, basic law. Uh, and that requires uh, a minimum of 61 votes out of uh, the Knesset, one, one Knesset's 120 uh, members. Um, so what does this law say? What, what does it include? Why is it so interesting? Uh, the law defines Israel as a Jewish state. Um, it promotes the creation of Jewish-only settlements. It removes Arabic as an official language of uh, the state of Israel. And uh, it defines national self-determination as the unique right of the Jewish people. Uh, this controversial law uh, was overwhelmingly criticized for constitutionally enshrining Jewish supremacy and reinstating Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people and the Jewish people only. 
It was met with strong opposition from 1948 Palestinians, among others, and it has been widely perceived as a turning point in the state's relationship with its Palestinian citizens. And um, I want to pause here for a second because as I said earlier, we hardly hear about 1948 Palestinians. And when we do, it is usually during or after key events or developments like this one that are often described as a turning point, but are they really a turning point? I myself almost fell into this trap a decade ago when I started writing my PhD thesis. And I assumed that uh, the 1948 mobilization, 1948 Palestinian mobilization in response to the breakout of Al-Aqsa Intifada back then that left 13 Palestinians uh, dead and hundreds uh, others injured, I thought that would be a turning point that will lead to some radical changes in political mobilization and attitudes towards the Israeli state. But I later realized that there was a lot of work and research that needs to be done to understand the political mobilization and the delicate dynamics of uh, this group. Another thing to note is the importance of acknowledging the diversity of 1948 Palestinians. They are not one bulk, they are not one unified group that you know, we can characterize by uh, 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 one uh, uh, way or another. Because naturally, like any other group, they hold different and opposing points of view with regards to their nationality, citizenship, and uh, self-determination. So, um, in my book chapter, uh, I discuss the enactment of the nationality law as a grievance added to and reviving uh, old uh, 1948 Palestinian grievances and uh, as contributing to political mobilization. I uh, review the responses by 1948 Palestinian uh, leadership, uh, 1948 Palestinian public and civil society. I know the diversity of ideological positions concerning the relevance and value of political participation in Israeli elections and in the Knesset. And in order to better understand the responses rather than response, the enactment of the law, uh, sorry, to the enactment of the law, I included a review of uh, the complexities of 1948 Palestinian political history and reality together with uh, an exploration of some examples of past uh, mobilization dynamics. Now, unfortunately, um, the writing of the chapter concluded as the results of the September 2019 elections were released. So um, um, I didn't really have uh, the chance to reflect on uh, further developments. Uh, now, the September 2019 elections resulted in, in reproducing the historic 2015 achievement of 1948 Palestinians um, when the uh, joint list, which is a coalition of 1948 Palestinian political parties, uh, they won 13 Knesset uh, seats. Uh, and that, that is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, it is supposed to give them a, a very heavy political weight. And the question back then, and, and this is how I, you know, uh, I ended my chapter, the question, the pressing question was whether um, Israel, or more accurately, whether a radical wing uh, government or a radical right government led by uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was ready to have the joint list or a 1948 Palestinian political party or a coalition of parties uh, which, which was at the time the third largest uh, political party in the Knesset, was it ready to have it within the government coalition? Now, as we all know it, the answer of course was no, and the, the rest uh, is history. Uh, but since then, many more interesting events unfolded, including the, what I call, the ill-timed split of the Islamist uh, United Arab uh, party or list from the joint uh, list in January 2020 and its decision to run on its own in March 2021 elections. In those elections, uh, surprisingly or not surprisingly, the United Arab list headed by 
um, Mansour Abbas, uh, they won four seats and the joint list won only six seats. And against all odds, it became the first party, we're talking again about an Islamist party, Palestinian party, it became the first party to ever become part of a government governing uh, coalition in Israel. Uh, the last time in 1940, Palestinian um, uh, party supported a coalition, not by being part of the coalition, was in 1993. So what has changed? Was it only the desire to remove Netanyahu that created the coalition, stretching from Naftali Bennett to Mansour Abbas? And the other pressing question is, can that coalition govern? And for how long? Now, in addition, uh, there were uh, the violent events last May, uh, so-called riots, that shed their lights and left their uh, 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 stamp on an already fragile uh, Israeli-Palestinian-Jewish-Arab uh, coexistence or relationship. Um, all of this, together with an unprecedented violence uh, sweeping 1948 Palestinian streets, they all call for further investigation into the extent and nature of the political participation of uh, and rule of 1948 Palestinians in Israeli politics. Um, and finally, all of this also uh, restates that any attempt to find a lasting peace solution without addressing the issue of 1948 Palestinians uh, will be undermined. Thank you. Okay, I will start. Uh, thank you, Nina. Thank you, Alon. And uh, thank you, special thank you to Omer for inviting me to take part in this uh, fascinating book event. Um, as historian of education, I will just go back to the 19th century and will not deal the um, political situation now. And I would uh, love to look back on my chapter in this volume titled Contested Pedagogy, Modern Hebrew Education and the Segregation of National Communities in Free State Palestine. And I would love to focus the topic of segregation of Jewish and Arab children in Palestine and Israel in the time frame of the late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. So it's kind of going back uh, to the roots of um, of this uh, segregation. And I will do so uh, through the lenses of history of education, focusing on a pedagogical method of teaching foreign languages that was implemented by Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe in Palestine among the children of the Jewish community and also sometimes among uh, Arab children. And while discussing the Hebraization of the educational system in Palestine, a particular emphasis, I put a particular emphasis on the tension, tension between a universalist pedagogy that was brought from Europe on the one hand and the segregation by ethnic and national affiliations on the other. And in the chapter, my um, uh, argument that is built with a lot of examples is that the full potential of the modern, even progressive pedagogy used to revive the Hebrew language was not fulfilled. Um, it's kind of uh, the road uh, that was not taken. Um, this ideology, this pedagogy brought with, with, with it a universalist uh, ideology, and that was not implemented in the Zionist uh, modern community. So rather than uh, bringing between, uh, bridging between two ethnic groups in, in conflict, Jews and Arabs, the emergence of the modern education system in Palestine deepened their mutual alienation and created two opposed national groups, Zionists and Palestinians. In other words, whereas in Europe, modern pedagogy had two strands, namely child-centered education, free from nationalism and government-run education, um, in the issue, these were merged, thereby transforming modern pedagogy from liberationalist to segregationalist. Um, this same Hebrew education system based on modern pedagogy was subsequently adopted to the Israeli national education system, simultaneously bringing with it also the ethnic segregation that had prevailed in the Ottoman Empire. And that of course, uh, brings us to look also at the present and the 
what does it mean when the children are raised in different uh, uh, school systems speaking uh, different languages. So my focus was the method uh, called the natural method um, to speak, uh, to learn foreign languages. In Europe, it was used to uh, learn um, a second language, but in, and I show it in the chapter, in, in the Hebrew case, it was used in order to uh, convert the children a mother tongue and to uh, create them as a mother tongue Hebrew speakers, although they were the first generation to speak Hebrew. Uh, how do you do it? How do you teach Hebrew uh, in this way? You just speak only Hebrew in class, and that was the method. And uh, this is why it was, uh, um, um, it, it enabled, or in potentially it enabled, uh, the studying together of Jews and Arabs. It happened also in the late uh, 19th century or in the second half of the 19th century, some cases of uh, uh, Arab speaking students in a uh, Jewish school that studied Hebrew through this language and they were, they had the same knowledge in Hebrew like other students that their modern talk was Ladino or Yiddish or other languages spoken in the issue. And there were cases of, um, of a Jewish or yeah Jewish uh, uh, pupils in uh, Arab schools, also uh, missionary schools that were uh, learning uh, literary Arabic in this method. Uh, a special case I uh, show in my uh, article is the case of uh, Chaim Keller, a teacher that uh, was working in Roshpina school and was invited by uh, the head of the village uh, Jauni to teach Hebrew, the children of uh, the Arab village. And um, what is amazing that he writes in his memoir that he uh, taught Hebrew uh, in the same method, uh, the Arab and the uh, Jewish students, but he never thought of combining them. And on the contrary, he says that teaching Hebrew just um, uh, raised and uh, and uh, made the, 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 the Arab people more aware of their own nation, nationality. So um, the, the paradox is that um, a method that was used to uh, bring uh, an, an universalist uh, pedagogy and ideology that uh, could use uh, to teach all children together was used in a different way. This is, uh, I think the article is written maybe in the sense of the road not taken because uh, late, lately in research, we see a lot of researchers showing that in the end of the 19th century um, in Palestine, Israel, uh, excuse me, Jews and Arabs lived together and made, and they had, uh, um, very um, close relationship in commerce, in neighborhoods, in speaking languages. Uh, of course, Arabic was the vernacular language for most of the people, even Jews. And it's interesting to see that although the situation was uh, that close between these communities, educational systems were always uh, separated. And uh, I think that uh, when writing this article, I, I saw that the opportunity of uh, universalist pedagogy to combine and to, um, to create a new uh, education system. And I, today, I think uh, I, I'm more naive. I see that uh, actually the interesting point is that this opportunity was never thought and never seen by any of the participants. Uh, and um, actually the continuity of the segregation was just deepened. But before, I think what was changed is the imperialist, uh, imperial uh, point of view of ethnic groups which have their own educational systems and the nationalist point of view of um, segregation, even if they study the same material, the same methods. Um, so it seems clear that the segregation was the inevitable result of nationalist views and not of the pedagogical preference for the natural method called Ivrit Bivrit.
That is neither the natural method nor pedagogy determined this segregation since they could have been effective for all students in the acquisition of both Hebrew and Arabic. And the compatibility between an effective method for teaching foreign languages and the needs of nation building, especially in the linguistically complex case of the modern Jewish community in Eretz Israel or Palestine, did not lead to de facto segregation in the education system. On the contrary, implementing the method could have contributed to, con to overcoming the segregation that resulted from the different languages and was a remnant of the ethnic segregation that had existed previously in, uh, in Palestine during the Ottoman Empire. I will end here. It was just a short look on this, uh, the roots of the segregation between uh, Jewish and Arab children in Palestine. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam, and, and also Alon. And of course, thank you, uh, Omer, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I want to join in congratulating Omer uh, and the other contributors on the publication of this book. And I also want to thank the Watson Institute and Christy Kilgus for all the behind the scenes work that makes such events successful. And of course, I'm honored to join such distinguished co-panelists. I admit that it's not easy um, to speak last, but I hope that I can add a few things to the rich comments um, that have already been given. When asked to comment on a book with nearly two dozen contributions and a remarkable variety of focuses, approaches, and perspectives, it's not easy to know where to start. So I figured as good a place as any perhaps is the title, or more specifically in this case, the subtitle, Lands and Peoples because I think this formulation provides a clue to some of the volume's many successes. Lands and peoples, and not the more frequently used one land, two peoples. A more open-ended formulation. Indeed, what emerges in the contributions to this volume, despite their diversity or perhaps because of it, is that we may be better off not assuming that we already know what lands we're talking about and which peoples. Rather, the contributors help us see how specific lands and peoples come into being at different historical conjunctures through ritual, law, education, planning and construction, and of course, violence. These lands and peoples are not static or essential, but dynamic, contingent, diverse, and multiple. Take, for example, Rachel Haberlock's chapter, which unsettles the notion that Mandate Palestine's borders were either arbitrary in one narrative or natural in another. Instead, Haverlock shows that they were produced in part through contests over the routes and methods of transporting oil within and beyond the region. Or as Orna Vaadia shows, material factors are always shaping and, and shaped by political imagination and ideology, which work to confirm or challenge the naturalness of geopolitical borders. Indeed, the terminology of Israel-Palestine or Palestine-Israel can sometimes imply a neat equivalence between these spaces when this is never really been the case, whether on the ground or in imaginations. So Man Abu Sitta's chapter, for example, offers an approach to Palestinian repatriation based in part on the fact that the map of Palestine, that is where Palestinians lived before 1948, is not exactly the same as the map of Israel, that is where Israelis live today. In other words, looking beyond common political boundaries to the different substance found between them. Abu Sitta stresses the feasibility of repatriation based on the availability of land and the possibility of compensation. But the implementation of such a plan would require more than this kind of accounting. Indeed, it calls for a complete overturning of the existing relationship between lands and peoples. Or as Yunon Cohen and Neil Gordon put it in their contribution, the mutually constitutive production of race and space. The contributions um, from Nida Shokhri and Said Zidani, among others, clearly demonstrate that this is not just a requirement for Palestinian refugee repatriation, but constitutes the heart of the ongoing struggle of 1948 Palestinians, as well as Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. And Debbie Farber and Omar Al-Ghubari offer an example of this struggle in action. Khanan Heber, meanwhile, in his chapter on Hasidic immigration to Palestine before the 20th century, shows us that we need not look too far back in the past to find very different kinds of relationships between lands and peoples being lived out in this space. It's a reminder that past and present arrangements of lands and peoples, 
of race and space are not inevitable, but contingent, and that the same is also true of the future. The future-oriented contributions to this volume offer compelling models for reconfiguring that relationship between lands and peoples within the pre-1948 borders of Palestine or the Mandate Palestine borders to produce a more just future for Palestinians and Israelis. But in reading those future-oriented contributions, I also found myself inspired by the more historical contributions and trying to force myself beyond the borders of these lands and peoples as they're presently assumed to exist. And I'll give you an example uh, of what I mean. I was struck in Ayn Lustig's chapter on state demise that of the 21 countries selected by population and plugged into Google with the search term, will X country survive, Jordan returned the third highest number of results. Now Lustig focuses on Israel, the country with the highest number of results by far, but what about the possibility of Jordanian state demise? What would that mean for Palestine, Israel? Surely many more have also been asking, will Lebanon survive? Will Syria survive? Will Iraq survive? I could go on. What kind of path forward for Palestine, Israel, for Palestinians and Israelis can ignore these questions or this context? I'm reminded of uh, Konstantin Zureik's famous book, Ma'ana Nekba, The Meaning of Catastrophe, which is widely credited with pointing the term Nekba to refer to the disaster that befell Palestinian society in 1948, including the expulsion of some three quarters of a million Palestinians from their homes. But when Zureik spoke of Nekba, he had in mind the broader Arab world. The failure of the Arabs to prevent the fall of Palestine was not merely a catastrophe for Palestinians, but was evidence of the catastrophe that the Arabs as a whole were living, the failures of Arab society and of Arab states. Now, I'm not here to endorse uh, Zureik's particular vision or suggesting that we all revert to 1950s style Arab nationalism. But if we take seriously the notion that many Palestinians identify as part of a greater Arab nation, not to mention the fact that millions of Palestinians live in the Arab world, but outside of Palestine, then this dimension needs to be addressed, just as we must consider the relationship between Israeli Jews and Jewish communities around the world. Academically, however, work on Palestinians has increasingly meant work on Palestinians in the West Bank or inside Israel. There are practical reasons for this, of course, and again, we might think about how material factors shape political imagination. But this widespread adoption of settler colonialism as a framework of analysis also, which this volume uh, engages fruitfully, has also tended to marginalize regional dynamics, while at the same time bringing Palestine into scholarly conversation with developments in the United States, Canada, Australia, South Africa, and so on. But what about the refugee camps in Lebanon, Syria, or Jordan, where Palestinians have lived for more than seven decades? What about the Arab media, education, culture that have shaped generations of Palestinians? I don't say this to dispute the usefulness of settler colonialism as a political or an analytical framework. I think it's been incredibly productive. Um, but just to raise a question about what are its and, and what are our blind spots? All this is to say that Israel-Palestine lands and peoples, like any good work of intellectual production, not only challenges our pre-existing understandings and opens our eyes to new perspectives, but raises new questions and points us in, in new directions of academic inquiry. I'm gonna leave it at that. Uh, thank you for your patience and uh, thank you again for everyone and congratulations on Thank you for this rich and fascinating interventions. Um, we will move now to the Q&A and the speakers can show themselves on the screen. Um, and I'd like to start with two questions that um, they were asked separately, but they have uh, some, some relations. So one is, do any of the panelists believe there is a possibility of a two-state solution? And the second is, upon the abolishment of ethnic cleansing, apartheid, occupation, war crimes, what ways does the panel see to implement the inalienable right of return of Palestinians to their homes? So these are two, uh, two questions about what kind of, uh, of a future we can see for this piece of land. Um, anyone wants to uh, jump in? Uh, 
I may? Yes, please, may Adi. I? Yes, please, Adi. Okay. Uh, to the first question, I would say, uh, to the first question, I would say very, very shortly, there may be two states, it will not be a solution. Uh, <laughs> to the second, I want to say that one cannot think about the return of the refugees without thinking about a complete uh, transformation of the Israeli regime. So uh, I don't know if it, if this may happen, of and if it can happen, if it can happen only after uh, the transformation or through a transformation, uh, and there are so many uncertainties here that it is. I think it is simply a question that one cannot cannot answer. The only the only thing uh, the only thing that uh, one can hope for is more visions of the kind of the kind that. Uh, uh, Zohrot uh, and other uh, and, uh, organization um, promote. Um, how to answer this, I don't know. Um, if I may. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I would like to echo what uh, Adi just said. And uh, I think it also has to do with uh, uh, the nature and the reality of Israel nowadays. Um, as it's becoming more and more radical, um, a two-state solution is no longer, and I don't think it was ever a, 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 an option or a solution. Um, but basically what's happening right now in Israel, there are a lot of changes. A lot of the things that uh, Israeli politics and system thought that they could ignore for ages, including, as I mentioned earlier, um, the fact that um, over a fifth or a fifth of the population is Palestinian within Israel, the dem demographic threat or democratic problem, whatever you want to call it, all of these press Israel with, uh, and the Israeli politicians with uh, real challenges. And, um, you know, you can go ahead and uh, ignore um, ideological questions and ignore resolving issues uh, related to uh, the question of democracy and Jewishness of the state. Uh, but all of this eventually will explode in your face, and that's what's happening right now. Um, we may see now the uh, uh, current coalition and uh, um, the cooperation between the 1948 Palestinian political party and uh, uh, radical right wing uh, uh, um, in Israel. But to how it, to what extent is that uh, coalition sincere and real, and uh, how long can it last? Uh, it's very fragile. Um, the situation in Israel is just getting worse and worse. Um, I myself can um, is a witness because you know I left Israel. I lived for um, over 13 years away, and I came back. Um, and the changes that I'm seeing, the radicalization that I'm seeing, the racism, uh, the fraction not only between Israel Israelis or Jews and Palestinians, but also between Israelis themselves. Uh, uh, um, uh, right wing and left wing, uh, religious and secular, um, all of this will force itself eventually, and uh, it will be, uh, you know, if Israeli politicians and Palestinian politicians do not want to reach uh, a settlement, it, a settlement will be dictated either by the street, by the people, or by uh, a higher or a, a, a someone from uh, an outside uh, player that will say that's it enough is enough um and you know you must sit down reach a conclusion and i think uh, reach a settlement and i think basically a one state solution one democratic normal state and and then it doesn't matter if you're a palestinian or, or a jew or an israeli you're a citizen with full rights uh, and uh that's it, like any normal uh, country in the world. Some other comments about the two questions yeah, uh, or if there are the panelists. I? Yeah, sure, Ila, go, go ahead. I raised yeah. my hand, but it doesn't work. Doesn't matter. Ah, sorry. <laughs> That's okay, it's okay. Uh, I just want to say something about the second question. And I noticed that uh, Salman Abu Sita is the one who posed it. So first of all, Salman's own project is, is for me a model 
for imagining how this uh, uh, right of return would be implemented in terms of space and cartography. Uh, so I think that's definitely one way forward and to look at it even in more detailed uh, way uh, on the basis of villages, towns, neighborhoods. I think it's important academically to do it, but no less important, I would say it's important to do it through imagination. One should imagine, imagine uh, how uh, destroyed villages would look. Some people have already built models of reconstruction. Some people just wrote about it. And I think that imagination is as important as the academic work that tries to explain scientifically how a return is possible uh, in terms of uh, property, land, uh, and uh, the need or the lack of the need to move people in order to uh, uh, rectify uh, uh, past evil. But I would just wanted to add that we can begin to imagine even more practically this if we support the uh, movement of the Palestinian uh, refugees inside Israel. Uh, more than 350,000 people now who have been uh, uh, dispersed between Palestinian villages by Israel on purpose in order to create tensions between the original people and the newcomers. And there are still tensions because of that until today. Uh, and to see how people who live sometimes a mile, sometimes two miles away from their destroyed village can envisage uh, their return. And I think this could be one step. And then, of course, uh, uh, this should be only one step towards implementing a wider uh, program. And uh, I don't think we have to wait for the decolonization in order to engage academically and imaginatively with uh, visions of uh, rectification of, of past evils. And there are also, uh, you know, principles by the United Nations and so on for how to implement repatriations and so on. Uh, I think this is an important infrastructural and groundwork uh, that uh, maybe, hopefully, one day would become useful if indeed uh, uh, the situation uh, would change. And, and I think this is something that quite a few of the younger Palestinian scholars and activists are engaged in anyway. So uh, I, I would just lend my support in any way I could for this kind of work. Thank you, Ilan. And I'd like to ask the panelists if you would like to uh, comment on, um, um, on another paper, on another panelist um, intervention. Do you have any comments about that or about these two questions, those who haven't? Uh... So if not, I'm going to give the word to Omer. Thank you, Alon. Um, and thank you, everyone. Uh, this was uh, very thought provoking for me, uh, all your papers. Um, and what I'd like to do in the next uh, five minutes or so is trying to actually think of them in, um, in relationship to each other. Um, and I admit that I was doing it on the fly because I was not sure what you would talk about, but it, it, there seems to be an interesting logic in them. And I'll go in the order in which you spoke. Uh, so I think Debbie and, uh, Debbie and uh, Omar in the, the contribution to the book what they really uh, talk about is uh, uh, related directly to what Abu Sita wrote on, but in a sense of speaking about how do you make utopia uh, possible to be thought of as a future reality. Um, and th that exercise of thinking of something that to one group of people is a, the existential threat as Debbie was showing, and to another group is a dream uh, that does not seem to ever be able to, make, to be made true, can actually be uh, constructed on the ground, uh, can actually be thought through as a future reality. And I think that that exercise itself is of huge importance because it opens up people's minds to think on the local, on the realistic, on the on the scale of a village, of a courtyard, of, 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 uh, um, 
of the part of a city. Um, mo moving on to Adi, I, I was very um, intrigued by two uh, terms that uh, you used, Adi. One is denial and the other is replacement. Uh, denial is something that I have been uh, more and more engaged in because I'm, I'm aware of the denials that uh, my own generation of Israelis uh, were raised on, a denial of the diaspora, Shlilat Gola, and a denial of the Nakba. Uh, although we grew up surrounding, surrounded by what had remained of a civilization that was uprooted, and the 1948 Palestinians that Nida talks about, also, in fact, that generation um, was raised on two denials. One was the denial of the Nakba because you could not talk about it, and the other was the denial of their identity, both as Palestinians and as part of the Arab nation. They were not even called Arabs or Palestinians. They were only called minorities. They were the Miutim. Uh, and that, that um, 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 reworking of those denials is in fact something that is crucial to understanding the reality of uh, Israeli-Palestinian society today. The term um, um, replacement, of course, has, has huge ramifications today because when we speak about replacement, we are talking, about, we are talking also about the great replacement. There is a right-wing French scholar that wrote on that in terms of Europe is being replaced. Uh, that, of course, has anti-Semitic and Nazi associations, if this was picked up by the, the American right, and the replacement, when you speak about it within the context of Israel-Palestine, is the notion that you can replace one people with another, and the fixation of Zionism on a fada, on separation. The, the separation is what you do when you have not succeeded in replacing, when the replacement is incomplete. So the other side of this is, I think, what, what, what Elon, if I understand Elon correctly, is really talking about. What, what Elon is talking about is not necessarily two states or one state or, or, or binational state, but it's rather making a homeland into a place where the people who live in it would be at home. And the people who live right now in that state are not at home. The neither of them are at home. This is, you were referring to, to uh, Ian Lustig's um, um, piece. It's all about that. There is a sense of not being home and that the only way to be able to feel at home is through a reconfiguration of how that society operates. And right now it's a society that alienates all its citizens, or, or not only citizens, but all those who are under its control. And I think that in, in, in this sense, what, what, what Nida is talking about, and particularly this curious case right now with the, an Israeli government that finally, for the first time, has an Arab party um, and an Islamist uh, Arab party in it, um, is that the linchpin for that, uh, beginning process of feeling at home, of people being at home, is with the 1948 Palestinians. That group that was often forgotten and neglected by the Israeli left and by the Palestinians outside of the state or outside of the occupied territories, that is in fact the group that can bring people home because it is the one that is both part of Israeli society, Nili Willy, and is part of Palestinian, the Palestinian nation and the Arab world. And, and I think that for, for me, um, that was just the right moment for uh, Miriam to step in because we can think not only of the great loss of Zionism having come to Palestine, and having wanted to create itself around the language. This was the project. The project was to create a new nation around a language and its complete blindness, uh, willful blindness to 
the other to the language of the region that great myth of inability to even conceive of the bilingual educational system the only way to bring people home is to actually provide them with a bilingual education is to raise a population that would feel at home in both languages uh, not that this is i know that there's some places where this is attempted, but um, by and large, of course, this is not what's happening. And the only bilingual population in the state of Israel, uh, 1948 Palestinians, but the project of being at home with both languages, I think, can be um, at the core of this kind of process. And in that sense, I, I, I'll just end by saying that what Alex was saying on the contingency of lands and peoples is, is precisely hitting the nail on the head because all of this, we, we all of us, including I think all of us here on the panel, are locked into certain perceptions, certain expectations, certain uh, paradigms that it's very hard for, for us to escape. And if we begin to think about the contingency of our own, um, expectations. And Alon would know that, uh, well, I mean, I lived in uh, Berlin uh, uh, less than a year before the war came down. Nobody expected that war to come down. No one. Absolutely no one. And now no one knows exactly where it was. You, you have to put all kind of landmarks to say this is where the war was. It's forgotten. That kind of contingency of lands and peoples, I think, is where we always have to go back and not allow ourselves to be imprisoned in the present, but also think about Debbie's utopia, realistic utopia of the future. So that's my own response. Thank you. Thank you, Omer. Do we have any response to the response? Was there another, um, there was another I question, I think. Sorry. Oh. What do you say, Omer? No, I just said, I think there's another question, wasn't there? I'm saying, there I'm, is. Um, but I'm sorry, I didn't mean to uh, step in on. Uh, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a question of one of my students, so I have to ask it. To what extent academia and scholarship have the capability to advocate for the Palestinian liberation and freedom? I'm just not sure that in the next four minutes we are going to resolve this issue. But if someone wants to to uh, to have a crack at it, great. Yeah, yeah. Please, I, I, I really like the question. Yeah, <laughs> I founded uh, I founded the Center for Palestine Studies in the University of Exeter, the first ever Center for Palestine Studies in a Western academia within the university, exactly because of that question. I believe that academic work has to be political, has to be activist on Palestine. Uh, it has to be relevant for helping liberating Palestine. This is not uh, a work that is just um, academic. It's a work which is moral uh, and has a lot to do of your own sense of your morality and the sense of morality around the world. We are not rocket scientists. We are dealing with human beings and human history. And I think the greatest development ever happening really in, in this field, and time will tell how important it is in the overall uh, decolonization of and freedom in Palestine. I think the most important development was is that positions that were regarded as Palestinian opinions, as Palestinian ideas or even slogans or propaganda even, uh, as, as recent as uh, the 1980s, that these positions, looking at Israel as a settler colonial state, looking at Zionism as colonialism, looking at Israel as apartheid, these positions are now stated also as the conclusion and the results of, of academic work. Uh, uh, the, a certain perceptions and interpretation of the reality in the past and the present is now solidified also as an academic position, while it used to be an activist or a political position. Uh, Zionism until the 1980s succeeded in doing it, uh, but reality on the ground uh, uh, debunked uh, this uh, uh, Zionist uh, propagandist attempt. 
And I think this is why it is so important to choose as a student, as a postgraduate student, topics which relate, if you are interested in Israel and Palestine, which relate to this, uh, uh, to the moral dimension and not just the factual dimension of, of uh, the reality over there and regard every work as modest as it might be contribution to liberate the mind, the knowledge, or if you want to decolonize the knowledge, decolonize the mind, and hope that at the end of the day, it would help to decolonize the country itself. Thank you. Um, I want to briefly just say two things about uh, the role of academia and scholarship. I think, you know, there are two things that academia should uh, uh, be responsible of, and that one thing is breaking uh, uh, conflict, uh, enhancing myths. Uh, and the second is uh, encouraging uh, fact-based discourses, both within the academia and in the scholarship that uh, we produce. I'd like to thank all of you for a fascinating discussion. We are left with uh, some certainties and a lot of questions. That's how it should be, I guess. Uh, thank you to all of you. And thank you to our audience and to the questions. And good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>